Let's pray. Uh, Father, we do, as, as I just think about what's going on around us now with, with this whole thing we're trying to deal with, with this COVID thing, and uh, Lord, just all the, all the junk that goes on with it. I, I pray, Lord, for you to bring wisdom and bring some order into some of the chaos. And the same with the riots and demonstrations, Lord. And God, we do, we wanna see justice done. We wanna see justice brought forth. But Lord, we don't get justice with injustice. And, and I just pray for a calming effect on our nation that you would move mightily. And, and Lord, I know that COVID has not caught you by surprise. George Floyd and the riots have not caught you by surprise. And God, I just pray that you would allow your church to rise up in the midst of all of this and that we could be a light in the darkness, that we could be a beacon that draws people to you. So as we study the word today, and as we look at you speaking to a church a couple thousand years ago and, and the things they were dealing with and the stuff they were trying to figure out, I pray, Lord, that you would speak to our hearts. And God, just like you, change the face of that church, change the face of our church. Change us one heart at a time. So God, I pray that you would move in a mighty way today as we read your word. And we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Hey, as we've been, and behind me, we've been talking about faith, whether we wanna call real faith, mature faith, growing up faith, but I'm praying that as we've gone through Galatians and James together, that it's motivated us into that area where we're, we're learning to trust God more, we're learning to believe him more, and then we're learning to act on what he is showing us. And so, you know, that to me is, is mature faith. When you not just read your word, but you start doing your word, and you start fleshing it out. So, you know, Paul's continuing here and, and, and letting us know that, and, and this is kind of the real, real, real practical stuff. He's letting us know that, you know what, we need to care about each other. We're all in this together, and even if you're watching online and if we get separated again and have to do things online, we're still in this together. We're one big family, and whether we like it or not, that's who we are. And I know, listen, I know sometimes you don't, you know, you look at your family and you go, wow, what part of the family did he come from or she come from? And, and I get that. We look at each other and kind of do the same thing. But we're family. And here's an interesting thing. In the Bible, one another is used over and over and over and over. I jotted down at least 12 times. I didn't put these references, but at least 12 times in the New Testament, we're told to love one another, and we're commanded to do that. And then these I jotted down. In James chapter 5, we're told this, pray for one another. We just saw that, just read that last week. In 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, we're told to build up or edify one another. In Romans chapter 12, we're told to prefer one another. And then in 1 Peter, we're told to show hospitality to one another. And we could go on and on. Listen, we're in this together and we're supposed to care about one another. Although we live in a culture that is extremely selfish and a culture that's all about self, right? I, I love thinking about, and, and uh, this isn't new, but I love thinking about, hey, some of you may not remember, but some may. Re there was, back in the 50s, you had the magazine Life, right, about life. And then we went from life, and we got a little bit more narrow, and we went to people. And we had the magazine People. And then we went a little bit more narrow, and we had the magazine Us. And it was all about us. And then we got very, very narrow and we have the magazine Self. That's just where we're at. And we've got to watch that. Listen, as a culture, we cannot allow the culture to change who we are as Christians. As Christians, we are supposed to be involved with one another. And I believe with all my heart, this place should be the safest place in the world. You should be able to walk in here and feel safe and know that you're not gonna be judged, you're not gonna be condemned, you're not gonna be shot down. I don't mean that literally, but you know, I had to qualify that. But you know, hey, we need to know it's safe. Like, I don't like going in hospitals. 
I don't like going in hospitals because there's things that you see that are like, whoa. And you have just a feeling, and then there's just an odor in hospitals. Why? Because they're treating people. They're fixing sick people. You know how the hospital can stay pristine and perfect and, and, and not, not have any odor, not, not let any sick people in? And what's sad is, that's what the, most churches want to do. We don't want to get smelly. We don't want to get messy. So we don't want any sick people in here. That's the wrong attitude. Hey, we should care about sick people. As your pastor, I love it. I love seeing younger believers, newer believers, I guess I should say, because they're, they're not always young. And I love it because they make messes, man. They say some things. And I love to watch the, you know, the seasoned saints. And when one of those, one of those new believers says something bizarre, like they're like, whoa! and they're all freaking out and stuff, and I just, I just sit back and laugh, because I think it's hilarious. People make messes, because we're messy, and we need to know that. And when we understand that we are all in this together, and listen carefully, and we all make messes, none of us are excluded from that, that then we can really become the church. Now, when we left off in James, James told us that if we turn somebody, right, if somebody's turned from their ways and we bring them back, that we have done something phenomenal, right? Reach out to people, but he never really explained how. And then Paul left off here in chapter five and he said, don't be conceited or provoking one another or envying one another. And then now in chapter six, He's going to finish up what James started in chapter 5 and what he started in chapter 5. And listen what he says in verse 1. Brethren, if a man is overtaken in any trespass, you who are spiritual, restore such a one in a spirit of gentleness, considering yourself, lest you also be tempted. Hey, when we see somebody train wrecking their lives, our responsibility is to reach out to them. Our responsibility is to restore them. We're not supposed to talk about them. We're not supposed to shoot them down. We're not supposed to judge them. We're not supposed to make them feel horrible. Our responsibility is restoration. And what's sad is, oftentimes as a church, we want to get all judgmental. We want to talk about them. We want to put them down. And oftentimes we do it this way. We need to pray for so-and-so because they did. Stop it. It's interesting that he says when they're overtaken. You know, and, and again, I think, I think these are, he's talking about us. We're going through life and it's almost like a sin is chasing us. And <laughs> And then it goes over us. And, you know, when I, when I read this, I think of people like doing a relay race or something and, or just a long marathon or something, and they, they bite it, right? And they just hit the ground and they roll and they're all dusty and dirty. And I think of those kind of people, right? That's what I think of. They're kind of overtaken. You and I need to go get that person, help them up, dust them off, and let's get them going again. Instead of going, oh, man, you look gross. Well, wow, you really messed up. Ooh, I'm glad I don't do that. And we do those sort of things. We're supposed to be, listen, we're supposed to be there. They're overtaken by the, any trespass. If you're a Bible marker, mark down any. Because some of us will help people out of certain things, but then, oh, they did that? He says any trespass. If you see somebody messing up, don't, don't get your little calculator out on what is the okay sin and what is a really bad sin. Just help them. Just be that person. I'm going to restore them. And the word he uses here for restore is a, is a word that, that basically means, some people talk about fixing fishing nets, but most of us have no clue on, on that. But it's, it's also used of setting a broken bone. And... I've had a broken bone. I broke my leg real severely. And setting a broken bone, for the doctor to set that broken bone, it's going to be painful. Why? Because he wants to fix you. He doesn't want your foot going like this the whole time and, and laying sideways. He's got to <laughs> and put it back, right? And so there is some pain involved. 
But you're supposed to restore that. You're supposed to get it back where it's strong, where it's doing well. Well, and that's what that's what he's calling you and I to do. Oh, well, he does say, and some of us some of us say, listen. He says, "You who are spiritual, restore such a one." And some of us go, "Well, I don't, I, don't, I really don't know if I'm spiritual enough." Yeah, you are. He's just told us in chapter five. The works of the flesh are and he lists them. And then he says the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, faithfulness, and self-control. He gives us that, right, and tells us this is what's going on. And then listen, now he's, if, you're, if you're born again, you have the Spirit of God in you. Do you understand that? You have the Spirit of God dwelling in you, guiding you, directing you. So therefore, you are spiritual. And if you rely on the Spirit of God, listen, you're going to do that instead of being that pharisaical, judgmental person where you're looking at him and you just want to, you know, here, here's what I think a lot of people do. Like you're drowning, man, and you're like, you're like up to here and you're sucking water, and you're sucking water in and you're drowning, and here's what they go, here's a brick. And you go, bloop, 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 bloop. why don't you give me a brick? Well, because I'm, I'm so, I'm so pure and you're so not do you remember in john chapter 8 remember the woman caught in adultery remember the pharisees what did they do they didn't care about her as a person they didn't even care about her spirituality what they care about perception so you bring her to jesus and you know, obviously they're trying to trap him, but they bring her to Jesus and, and all they want to do is put her down and make her feel unworthy and unwanted and uncared for. Paul in chapter 21, remember when they came after him? Same scenario, they came after him and they said, oh, he brought somebody into the temple. No, he didn't, but it didn't matter. They just wanted to put him down and make him feel uncared for and unwanted. And that's what people in the world and that's what Pharisees and that's what hypocrites do and that's what self-righteous people do. But Paul's telling you and I, we're not supposed to be those people. We're supposed to be those people that we care about that individual and we're going to care about that individual. And you know what? We're going to restore them. And we're going to do it with a spirit of gentleness. That doesn't mean, listen, here's the important thing. That doesn't mean we sweep something under the rug. doesn't mean that we don't care and we just, we just get it under the rug. It means that we're going to be careful about how we do it. Last week when we talked about James and going, every time, every time I think about restoring somebody and somebody caught up in something, I can't help but always, I always go back to King David and Nathan. And hey, if you're around, and this is talking about believers, I think you could go up to any believer, you could sit down with them, you could kind of look them right in the eye, and here's what you can tell them. Let me tell you a story about a lamb. And they're instantly going to know where you're going because you care. Nathan cared about David. He didn't just want to bust David. He wanted to restore David. Our heart has to be about restoration. So he says, listen, man, you do it in a spirit of gentleness. And then he gives us this last little thing. He says, hey, considering yourself, lest you be tempted. Here's what he knows, man. We're, we're all tempted. Now, I, I think here he might be you're tempted to hammer them and come down on them and act like you're all that and they're not. But there's also, Paul tells us in 1 Corinthians chapter 10 that those who, are, who stand need to, need to beware, right? Therefore, let him who thinks he stands take heed lest he falls. Kind of that same attitude. We have to be careful when we're restoring somebody. Not that we're gonna catch something, not that they have like COVID-19 and we have to stay away from them and do certain things. He's saying, you need to be careful and consider how you do it lest you get caught up in sin yourself. Now, I love that. Listen, I think verse one, I think verse one's phenomenal. I think, I think here he, he did all of this stuff. He prepared us. Paul has given us the history of legalism and the heresies, how they've treated him, where he's come. He's given us theological principles. And now he's going, come on, man. Let's go flesh this out. Let's go be the church. And let's do this. And let's start restoring people. Let's welcome messy people in here. Don't get all uptight if messy people come in. And he says, let's start doing it. And, and as we do that, now check out, I think verse two, this sums up verse one. 
completely. Verse two says, bear one another's burdens and so fulfill the law of Christ. What is the law of Christ? Love one another, right? The whole world will know that you're my disciples by the bickering and fighting and gossiping you do. No, by the love that you have for one another. That's the law of Christ. And here's what he's telling you and I. We have a responsibility to bear one another's burdens. When he talks about burdens here in chapter two, he's talking about a huge, you know, last night I used the idea of a huge refrigerator. You don't pick up a refrigerator and move it on your own. And a couple guys looked at me like, really? I do it all the time. So I don't know what to use, you know. It's like I personally do not pick up refrigerators and move them alone. I need help. Even if it's just a dolly to help, I need help to move that refrigerator. And listen, he's talking about an overwhelming burden that you cannot handle on your own, and you're caving under that. Whenever I read verse 2, now here's a little bit of transparency and don't judge, right? We talked about not judging. Don't judge your pastor, a little bit of transparency. Every time I read Galatians 6, 2, I think of this. Years ago, I was watching The Apprentice. Don't judge. It was before it was a celebrity apprentice. It was when it was real people trying to do it. And there was a guy on there. As a matter of fact, he's on another show now called Boise Boys. He's a believer. But he was on The Apprentice, and, and they had to do certain tasks, and they would make different people head over the tasks to see how they do, yada, yada. So I don't have to explain the whole game. But... I just remember this guy, Clint. I remember Clint, and he came, and they made him the head over the task. And here's what I remember what he said to everybody. He goes, and he's a big guy from Texas. All right. He says, y'all get on my back, and I'll carry you into the promised land. <laughs> That's what Paul's saying here. Tell people, get on your back, and I will take you. When, when was the last time you got a hold of somebody and said, I want to make sure you make it? I care about you as an individual. I want you to get across that finish line. I want you to make it. If I have to, I will carry you. I will do whatever it takes so that you can be the man or the woman of God that God wants you to be. If we're really honest, we don't do that too much. But that's what he's commanding us here. Bear one another's burdens. Be that. You know what would happen to our world if we would really begin to flesh this out? We would transform the entire world. I believe that with all my heart. Because 12 guys did a pretty good job. There's a whole bunch more than 12 just in this service. And watching at home, thank you. But listen, we need to put some things down and interact with each other and care about each other. And I know, I know we have the whole thing going on now. But you can still care about one another. You can still carry one another's burdens. And man, Paul, listen, and this isn't a suggestion in chapter two. It's a command. Here's what you need to do, man. You need to bear one another's burdens so you fulfill the law of Christ. Don't, don't, start, don't start thinking you're all that. Well, he says that the next verse. But that goes right in my head when he says, so you fulfill the law of Christ. For if anyone, verse three, if anyone thinks of himself to be something when he's nothing, he deceives himself. Hey, just because, hey, just because God might have used you in some way, you're still nothing. Who do you think you are? Why do you think that you're more important than anybody else in the body of Christ? We are all important in the body of Christ. Just like we talked about our physical bodies. Aren't you really glad that your lungs stay where your lungs belong? Aren't you glad like your lung doesn't come and like, Pfft. it'd be gross. But that's sometimes what we do with the body of Christ. We think, we, well, and then, and then we start thinking we're saying, God, God may use us. And we start thinking we're somebody. My favorite, my most favorite introduction besides being called P Square today, I thought that was pretty cool. But besides that, when I was in Montebello, California, tough area, Pastor Pancho Juarez, I remember, I remember Pancho got up and here's, here's how he introduced me. He goes, hey everybody, here's another zero serving a hero. Yes, yes. That's what it's about. You guys, if you've been here a while, you know my illustration. We're all just a bunch of hoses. We're just hoses that the Holy Spirit has flown through. All you are is a hose. Do you water your plants and thank your garden hose? Oh, thank you so much for carrying the water for, no. 
You drag that thing across dirt, you stick it in mud, you don't care about it, you don't take care of it, you get mad when it kinks up, you get mad, you get a cheap hose and it kinks up and you're like, I hate this hose, and then you cut it in half and you start doing, all you are is a hose, it's all you are. Now, hopefully you're not kinking up and God's cutting you in half, but do you get my point? Stop thinking about yourself as invaluable to the body of Christ. Do you know that God is gonna get his will done with or without us? We can be part of it or not. We are not gonna, I I remember as a young Christian being taught that if I didn't do my part, I was messing up God's plan. That's a pretty big burden to carry. You're a young believer and you're thinking, man, if I mess up, God's whole world is gonna crumble. That's heavy, but that's what legalists put on you. God is gonna get his work done with or without you. Now the joy we get is we get to participate in it once in a while. Once in a while, man, he takes us hoses and he flows through us and we go, yes, woo! And it's all exciting. I like to tell people this too. If you... If you're into genealogy, and, and we'll just skip all of the, you know, Ancestry.com and 23andMe and all those guys, and we'll just, like, skip several generations and go way, 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 way back. And our great, 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 great grandfather was Adam. Right? And you know who, where Adam came from, don't you? Adam came from dust. So your great, 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 great grandfather was dirt. Just thought I'd let you know. When you start thinking you're all that, just do your genealogy and figure out where you came from. Hey, you're not all that. But some of us, we begin to, God will use us, and then we start thinking highly of ourselves. And we start thinking we're indispensable, and we start thinking he needs us. And here's what Paul says here, then you become deceived. And now you get in a place where Here's what happens, man. It's a, it's a slippery slope. All of a sudden, you think you're so much better than everybody else, and you are not going to help that person. You're not going to carry someone's burden. Why should I carry their burden? They, they know who I am. And you're not going to restore that person who's, who's messed up and tripped up, and, and, and you know, they're, they're down in the dirt, and you're just going to look at them and say, that's where you belong. Look what you did. He says, don't deceive yourself. Don't start believing that. My prayer is from now on, at least you guys who are listening to me, you understand dirt. That's where you came from. And you kind of keep that hidden in your heart so when you start like thinking, you just go, oh, dirt. I'm hoping that echoes in your head. Dirt, that's where I came from, dirt. And then we understand that. Now, listen, he goes a little bit further because when we start deceiving him ourselves, then he tells us if you get caught up in that trap, verse four, but let each man examine his own work and then he will, he will have rejoicing in, his, in himself alone and not in another for each shall bear his own load. Now listen, this is a little bit, some people say you know, four and five, especially five, contradicts verse two. Because verse 2 says, bear one another's burdens. And then this implies that we're supposed to carry our own load. Well, we are. Is that contradiction? No. The first word, as I said, is like carrying an overwhelming burden. A huge, you know, we can just say a huge boulder as big as this room that, that no one's going to lift up. So some huge thing you can't move. You need help with that burden. This in verse 5 and what verse 4 is implying, we'll come back to verse 4. But it's talking about a backpack. Something you can handle. And here's the way I look at it. He says you need to examine yourself. You need to look at yourself. You need to be honest before the Lord. You need to find out what has God called me to? Where has God placed me in the body of Christ? What is my responsibility so that the body can function properly as it should? Then I will be okay with myself. Are you getting what he's saying? Because I'm functioning where I need to function and I'm carrying my own load. And then as I carry my old load, I'm going to help people with burdens that they can't handle. But God, this isn't talking about like God is going to put on some, oh, you have this heavy weight. 
No, he's gonna place us in the body of Christ right where he wants us in the body of Christ. The problem is some of us don't wanna be where he wants us to be. We wanna be something else. You don't get multiple choice. You don't get a you know, job application. You don't give them your resume. You don't let God know, hey, I'm really good at this and not so good at that. So you know, it's, it amazes me. When, when I got saved and I began to study the Bible, that's the first book I ever studied. I didn't read books in high school. I thought books were supposed to stay in your locker. I was a horrible student. I didn't study. I didn't care about studying. I hated history. And now what do I do all day, every day? Study. That's God. That's God. And I'm not saying he's going to change everybody that radically. Some of us, some of us, I think we're a little bit more obedient to the call of God younger. Like I had to rebel for a long time because I'm hard-headed. I'm Serbian, so I had to get to that place. But, but Listen, man, you find what God wants you to do, and then you do that with all of your heart. And I, I promise you, God's not hiding that from you. He's not trying to, he's not, he's not in heaven going, <laughs> they're gonna go around that corner, I'm gonna move it. Because that's what some people act like. I don't know what God wants. You know why you don't know what God wants? I'm gonna call you out. Because you don't ask him. And you don't ask him because you're afraid if you know what God wants and you're obligated and you have a responsibility now to do that. And if you can claim ignorance, then you go, I don't know what God wants or I would do it. When I was a kid in high school and we got in trouble, we had one police officer in Bisbee, I'll never forget him, Mr. Jewell. And he had a voice like this. And Mr. Jewell would come up and he would get us out of the car for being really nice young gentlemen. And he'd get us out of the car, and we would say something stupid like, I didn't know I wasn't supposed to have an open container in the car or something like that. You know, we'd say something stupid. We're high schoolers. And he would say, he'd always do this, ignorance of the law is no excuse. I thought, do you, do you say anything else? Well, listen, don't, don't say you're ignorant if you haven't tried. And I know, I, I know it's not as simple as just saying a prayer and God is gonna put that on you. I know that. But it's saying a prayer, walking with God, and doing things for God in the process of elimination. He'll guide you. He'll direct you. But we gotta start moving. So I believe that's what verse four, when verse four he says, let us examine our own work and then listen, we can rejoice in himself alone. Again, he's not telling us to isolate ourselves and be loners, but then we can say, I am doing what God wants me to do. I have confidence in what I'm doing because I know God wants me to do this. When was the last time you said that? I'm blessed, I get to say that every morning. I get to say that every time I start getting a message ready. You know when I'm gonna get next week's message ready? Start this afternoon. And I get to, yes, I get to do this. This is what God wants me to do. This is where he wants me to be. And I can rejoice in my work because I know I'm doing what God wants me to do. And I can have joy in that. That's what he's talking about here. And then I, I am responsible to carry that load. I don't look at somebody else and say, hey, you gotta do this. I don't hire people to read for me. That's a good idea. I don't hire people to read for me and study for me. I do it on my own. Because that's, my, that's where, gift, where God has gifted me. And then, listen now, as he talks about, listen, as he talks about bear one another's burdens, as he talks about we need to, we need to uh, uh, bear our own load, then verse six, we're gonna do verse six today and next week. But verse six says this, let him who is taught the word share in all good things with him who teaches. Now, they say this is a difficult one to interpret. I don't think it's difficult unless you kind of want to avoid something. And you know, I got to be honest, it's kind of hard the way I'm going to explain it for me to do it today. But here's what I believe he's talking about. I believe he's telling us we have a responsibility to make sure those who are teaching us are compensated for that. 
We're taking care of them so that they can do the ministry that they were called to do. Now, some say, no, 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 no. Here's what he's talking about. He's talking about when you bear the burden of, with somebody and you help them out of a situation, then as you watch them grow and, and move, they're sharing that with you, that life with you, and now you rejoice in that. Well, I understand that's true. There's nothing more fulfilling as a pastor than watching somebody's life change and people doing what they're supposed to do. I get that, but I don't, I don't get that from here, especially when you think about verse five. Some people say this, they say verse five, they go, hey, pastor, you need to carry your own load, so get a job. That's what they say. And I think Paul's saying, listen, we have a responsibility to share, to share all things with those. If they're taking care of us and they're teaching us, we need to do that. And, and listen, I think it's a huge difference because here's what I know, man. I tried for a while being bivocational. By that I mean I continued making my pottery and teaching. And some, hey, I know some pastors, they do that their entire, their entire ministry career. And, and that's hard. It didn't work for me. I'm not wired that way because I couldn't, I can't focus on two things at the same time. I am not, yeah, I cannot multitask. Ask my wife. She goes, you are so dorky. And she goes, seriously? She goes, can't you do that and this? And I go, uh-uh. I go, notice no gum when I'm walking? She goes, pay attention, pay attention, sweetheart. I can't multi, so, so for me in that situation, I went full-time in ministry when the church offered me, well, I'm not gonna tell you how much. It was $400. They go, we can pay you $400 a month. I went, boom. Gainel said, seriously? And I go, yeah, we're gonna quit making pottery. We're going full-time, sweetheart. How are we gonna make it? We're gonna live on a $400 a month budget. That's what we're gonna do. We're gonna figure this out. And that's, but that's me, and I'm not saying everybody's that way, but listen, I think we have a responsibility. If, you, if we wanna be fed well and taken care of well and ministered to well, we have a responsibility to take care of that person. And now, I'm not gonna go on and on because it's a little embarrassing. This is where you want a guest speaker to teach chapter or verse six, and it's, it comes out, because I don't wanna come across like I'm poor mouthing. I'm taking, taken very well care of in this church, and I'm blessed by this church, and I appreciate it. So having said that, let's sum up what we're teaching and get out of this, because I'm getting embarrassed. So here's what Paul's saying. You and I, I I'm gonna just sum it up with this. I hope this makes sense. In life, we mess up. All of us. And we need one another more than ever in the mess ups than in the good ups, if you know what I mean. And we need to be making sure we're mending some broken bones and some broken lives and some broken people. And we should rejoice if it gets a little bit smelly in here, a little bit messy. Because people make messes. And messy people make bigger messes. And we should know, man, now we're doing something. We're accomplishing something. And then if we have to, do the fireman carry, carry right? You grab that person, you throw them over your shoulder, and you say, let's go, like my buddy from Texas. I'm gonna carry you into the promised land. Let's go. And let's keep that in our hearts. And church, if we will do that, we will change the face of this church. We'll change the face of Sierra Vista, and then we'll change Arizona, and then we'll change United States, and then we'll impact the entire world by leading people to Christ and giving them Jesus, and demonstrating what that looks like in reality, not somebody's makeup thing like, well, if you really love Jesus, you're all about love, and, and you don't, not. listen, that's, it is about love, but it's about true love, and true love cares about people who are messed up. They care about getting them out of that mess up. So let's start doing that, and let's change everything, and let's take up our responsibility. I'm willing to do my responsibility, 
And I'm not, talking about, I'm not talking about the financial thing. I'm talking about finding your load. I'll carry my load. Are you going to carry your load? Because that's all we're asking. If we all carry our own loads, woo, it gets easy. But I don't want to be carrying your load. If I got five loads on me, it's not going to be good. And here's the deal. If I'm doing that, I don't have any strength left to carry someone's burden. So let's do this and let's make a difference. Let's stand up and pray. Lord, I do thank you for your word here. And God, how it challenges us. And it seems like, God, you have timing for this fellowship that's, that's pretty crazy. And I thank you for the timing of getting into this passage right now during, during what's going on in our world, in our country. And I just pray that as believers in Jesus Christ, that we would be beacons. As believers in Jesus Christ, we would shine so bright that we would be able to impact the world around us. And God, that you would use us mightily. So I guess, Lord, what I'm asking is, just flow through us like water through a hose and reach the world through our lives. I'm gonna ask you to stay in an attitude of prayer for a couple more moments. And if you are here today and maybe something struck a chord and, and, and you don't know Jesus, I wanna encourage you right now to take that, take that step. Ask him to forgive your sins. Ask him to come into your life. Ask him to guide you. And I know if you say that prayer sincerely, he will answer it. All you have to do is call on his name. So I'm gonna lead you in a prayer and the first part of the prayer is gonna be you're gonna admit you're a sinner. That shouldn't be hard because the Bible says every single person ever born has sinned except Jesus Christ. So you're, you're in the same thing with everybody else. So just finally get to the place where you admit it. That's called confession. And then agree with God that you've offended a holy God. That's part of that confession. So I'll lead you in a prayer. You'll admit that. Then you're gonna ask God to forgive you. And today you will be born again. So maybe you've come here for years. Maybe you're just visiting today. Maybe you just tuned in online by accident and you watched for a while. Maybe a parent is sitting on you making you watch this. I don't know what's going on, but if you're online or if you're in this room and you want that relationship with Jesus, you want your sins forgiven, say this prayer with me, and it's gotta be, it's gotta be sincere. You don't have to say it necessarily out loud, you can, but you need to say it and you need to be sincere. Jesus, today, I confess to you that I am a sinner. God, I'm sorry that I sinned against a holy God. And right now, I'm asking you to forgive me. Jesus, thank you for dying for my sin. Thank you today for your forgiveness. And now I want you to come into my heart, Jesus, and guide me and change me. Come into my life and guide me. Today, I want you to be my Lord and my Savior. 